Welcome in guys to my guitar review channel. Today I'm checking out a very special guitar. I was looking for a Gibson Thunder Horse Explorer for a really, really long time. Even before I saw Metal Eucalypse, I had already seen the Silver Burst Explorer and I'm a huge fan of this finish. Here it is guys. I'm just as excited as the first time I opened this case. This guitar is amazing. So here we go. It's the signature guitar for Brandon Small, who makes the music for the extremely funny show called Metal Eucalypse. I know what you're thinking, music for an animated series, how good can it be, right? Nope. Check out some of the songs of the fictional melodic death metal band Dead Clock. Most of you probably don't even know that they have heard this band in the idiotic video of Batman twerking over the song Awaken. Remember this one? Other great songs from the three Dead albums are Mermaider, Hatred Copter, Dead Harmonic, a favorite of mine, Laser Cannon, Dead Sentence, and of course Thunder Horse, which gave the name of this guitar. There's a character named Squizgar Squiggy on the show who plays the exact same guitar and it even has the Gibson logo on it. But even though if you're not a fan of the show, the best thing about the guitar is that you can rock it without even knowing who Brandon or Squizgard are. It is just a modified Gibson Explorer and the only thing that distinguishes it as a signature, it is the Thunder Horse Truss Road cover. Man, I wanted this guitar ever since I saw it getting announced back in 2011, but back then I couldn't get one. Gibson made a limited run of 400 Thunder Horses that were priced around $1,500 if you get one off the shelf. They were sold out almost immediately and you don't see them very often at the second hand market. Every once in a while a guitar shows up and it's never in mint condition. Some are modified, some have dings and bruises, others are missing a case and so on and so on. But I never stopped looking. I just knew that I would find one in mint condition and I eventually did. There was an alternative. Back in 2013 Epiphone released a version, again with Squeeze Guards Quick Gift. There's a commercial of it in YouTube uh, with this character. The Epiphone Thunder Horse Explorer looked just as good, but I always wanted the big brother. So then came the summer of 2019 and I had just sold my Gibson Buckethead Studio Les Paul for twice the money that I bought it for, roughly around $2,600. Lucky enough, I managed to find the Thunder Horse the exact same day. I contacted the seller as soon as I found it. Here you can see the original listing of the guitar. The seller was located in Belgium, guitar shop named Guitar Candy. Sweet, huh? The guy I contacted was extremely polite and knew how to handle business. Imagine my excitement when I found out that the guitar was never displayed and it was sitting with the stock strings in the case ever since they got it. Just just shut up and take my money man, just shut up and take my money, take the asking price, I don't care, I want this guitar, I want it in this condition, right now. I've bought a lot of guitars over the years guys, but waiting for the Thunder Horse, you know this excitement when you order your dream guitar and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're refreshing to see where it is, oh it's in this country right now, oh it has moved uh, at noon to this country right now, it's coming soon. God damn it Romania, what are you doing with my guitar for two days, just send it already. After what has got to be one of the longest weeks in my life, the guitar was finally at my doorstep. It was perfectly packed, the case was absolutely mint guys, there wasn't a scratch on it. When I opened the case I saw that the guitar didn't have a scratch, it was like I got it from the store. Even better, the guitar was never displayed. Some guitars when they're sitting in stores, people try them out, they get some corrosion on the frets, things like that. My Thunder Horse, it was like just came out of the factory. I had this guitar for almost two years and I'm guilty man, I never got around to making a complete video of it, disassemble it, check it out. But here it is now on my workbench, so let's check it out in detail. I have never seen the entire top and the silver burst lines of the Thunder Horse because there was the pick guard in the way all the time, but now when it's removed you can see the cavities for the electronics, also removing the pickups. And let's remove my favorite thing in this guitar, the Thunder Horse. Thrust rod cover. Okay, let's check out the top 
without the pig guard in the sunlight, the original silver paint in the cavities, the black lines of the silver burst, the routing for the three-way switch. My first impressions of this guitar are really good. There are some huge issues with it, especially with the finish, but I will discuss those in detail in just a minute. Here we have the Burst Booker 1 pickup and Burst Booker 2. And once again, check out the full glory of the silver burst finish without the pick guard. Obviously, you cannot have the guitar without the pick guard because it has to conceal the cavities. But check out the lines without it right now. There is only one issue with the Thunder Horse, and it seems to be a big one. There are some finish checkings here near the pots and the bridge. Some guitars even have them here between the two pickups. There are some examples with less checkings, some with more checkings, but they all have them. And the theory is that all of the guitars have been dropped, but I really doubt that this is the case, because how the hell do you drop 400 guitars? Unless... But nah, I just think that uh, this is due to messing up the finish at the factory, the way the finish cured. Let's see what we got in the control section. First of all, you got your neck volume over here, then the bridge volume, and the master tone. And routed all the way down here is the three-way switch. You can see the routings here for the pickups. This switch though, it's called an L or right angle switch. You can find it in thin body guitars such as the HG, Firebirds, but mostly in Explorer type of guitars because there's no way to fit a regular three-way switch. You look how shallow the cavity is. I have noticed that the wall separating both cavities is really, really thin and I wanted to measure it. Look at this, 3.5 millimeters. This is really thin. Pickups are out of the way. Now let's check out the pickup cavities, starting with the bridge one. Solid mahogany top over here, no maple cap. Of course, we can't see anything because it's painted. Since this guitar has a nitro finish, it will go yellow and eventually the whole color will go greener over time. The next owner will be able to see the original color through the pickup cavities over here. Here you see the neck one. You can clearly see the neck joint over here. And I wonder what is this hole about? Is this... It's supposed to be some routing for the truss rod. Yeah, probably it is. Over here, you have the routing for the control knobs. You've already seen the routing for the pickups. And they've used this Gavit branded uh, silver braided wire for the pickups. Cable for the three-way switch. Let's check it out in more detail. As I already said, right angle or L switch used in Explorer, HG and Firebird type of guitars. Seems to be in perfect shape, switches perfectly, as expected from a mint guitar. Let's check out what pickups we have in this guitar. They're supposed to be burst buckers and indeed in the bridge position we can see burst bucker 2. I'm not sure what this wound by PS means. You can see the date stamped over here. Wound by PS, I've seen a big debate uh, on a forum about this. Uh, it's not a guy, should be a production stamp or something. Ah, let me know, guys, if you know. And over here, you can see the famous patent applied for sticker or PAF. Any surprises at the neck? Nope. Burst Bucker 1, again, wound by PS, same date and the same patent applied for PAF sticker. Wonderful pickups. I like them. Something else I've noticed that is probably normal for all you Explorer guys, but I'm not used to it because I come from less poles. I cannot point this three-way switch at the direction I want because look how shallow and narrow the cavity is. You cannot rotate it in the direction you want, so it always switches this or this way. It's not a problem, but it is something that you have to get used to. Uh, let's take one last look at this beautiful silver burst finish with all its glory without the pick guard. Unfortunately, you cannot have it without the pick guard because this is a front-routed guitar. The pick guard has to conceal the cavities. 
I've seen a couple of guitars on the internet with a swapped out white pickguard, but I am not a fan how it looks on this body, because you see the black one matches perfectly with the edges of the silver burst. I advise you, tighten those screws by hand. Sometimes when removing the pickguard on the cheaper guitars or older pickguard, it can twist on you. When you try to reinstall them, those holes may not perfectly match. I wanted to be absolutely sure so I tightened them one by one by hand and you do it like this on a cross first here and then you do the corners and then you finish up with the rest. Or if you're using an electric screwdriver make sure you have the proper bit so you don't mess up the heads of the screws it will look ugly on the top. Alright let's measure the resistance of those burst buckers. Burst bucker 1 should be around 6.5 Burst Booker 2 should be around 7.5. Right now we are at the bridge position. Huh. Slightly hotter. 8.9. Switching over to the neck. 7.5. And let's check out the middle position. Around 4. Checking out the hardware. You see guys, this is how your tailpiece is supposed to be set up. You shouldn't bolt it all the way down because your bridge will collapse. I had to deal with a collapsed bridge on a Greco guitar recently. If you're not aware what a bridge collapse is, basically when your strings are coming this way, connecting to the tailpiece, if it is bolted all the way down, strings are coming in at a steeper angle, pressing against the back wall of the bridge, causing it to bend over time downwards. And this messes with your string radius and can cause fret bus and all sorts of nasty stuff. I don't think bolting the tailpiece all the way down improves sustain that much. But if you absolutely have to do it, just top wrap the strings. This way you avoid bridge collapse in the long run. Let's check out the bridge and tailpiece, starting with the tailpiece. This was a surprise for me. I've never heard of Advanced Plating Incorporated. Turns out they're a company in Nashville. And Gibson outsources uh, the production of the tailpieces there. Well, I'm not entirely sure of, are they doing the entire casting or just the plating of the tailpiece? In any case, they did a wonderful job. Thunder Horse comes with this uh, Nashville Tunomatic style of bridge. Perfect condition, of course, this guitar was mint. You've seen this Nashville type of bridge on uh, a lot of guitars. It's one of the most copied pieces of hardware ever made. I'm gonna have to do some proper intonation because this guitar was in E standard and it's gonna go in drop C. The bridge height is adjusted by those two thumb wheels and they have studs on them. And the studs and thumb wheel are casted directly onto the bridge during production for easier fit. When I removed the bridge I saw some more checking lines that were not visible to me before that. You can see here around the poles. Now let's check out one of the things that got me sold on this guitar. It is the binding. The Thunder Horse has this beautiful cream binding on the top. I didn't expect cream binding to go that well together with a silver burst top, but it's looking sharp. But as some of you might already notice, there's a huge checking line going alongside the binding. And this one must be new, I haven't noticed it before, but I have to check it out on a proper light outside. Let's take it out and see. Yeah, this must have happened recently. It follows the entire length of the body alongside the binding. It's not that ugly, but it's there. It's probably how the finish ages. Let's check out the neck. First of all, it's a mahogany neck and it has rich light fingerboard. But honestly, if I don't point it out in person, you might not even realize it's not ebony. 2011 was the year that uh, Gibson started using rich light instead of ebony. You remember the big lawsuit, the FBI confiscated a lot of wood, ebony was really hard to supply, so they were thinking of alternatives. I will go in depth uh, about rich light versus ebony in another video. Jumbo frets and again we have this beautiful cream binding with fret edges. Dot inlays, side dot inlays in black. And let's have a look at this fingerboard on a daylight. See if we can spot any difference between ebony and rich light. I personally don't mind rich light. I have a couple of guitars with rich light fingerboards. There is the 2012 Silver Burst Custom, 
There's the 2015 uh, Cherry Sunburst Custom. As a collector, I would always prefer Ebony, of course, but Rich Light has many advantages over the Ebony fingerboards. For example, if you're doing a refresh job, Rich Light is much harder and doesn't chip as easily as the Ebony boards. In any case, we better get used to Rich Light and other substitute woods because the world supply of Ebony is running really, really low. Let's measure the nut. 43.2 millimeters or in inches 1.7 at the 12th fret we have 52.8 millimeters or in inches we have 2.07 neck thickness at the first fret is 20.2 millimeters or 0.79 in inches 12th fret neck thickness 21.6 millimeters and 0.85 in inches the scale length is 24.75 inches like with the Gibson Les Paul guitars but it feels a bit different here because of the shape of the body the 12 fret sits differently against your body what about the radius we have 12 inch radius you measure with this gauge right here at the end of the fingerboard you see it's 12 inches because it's not rocking not showing any light and if I put any of the other gauges, 7.25, you can see there's some light shining underneath it, so it's not correct. Neck profile is really slim, C-shaped, seems to be really close to the 60s type of necks. If you're a fan of those, you will feel right at home with the Thunder Horse. Since I have it here, let's compare it to this 2012 Silver Burst, same year as the Thunder Horse. The custom silver burst neck seems similar enough to the Thunder Horse, but you can see it has been beefed up a little bit on the sides, so it feels a little more chunkier. The nut was fitted perfectly to this Thunder Horse. Running my fingers through it, I don't feel any excess material or just uh, they took too much out of it. It's perfectly flush with the binding, perfect height too. No tuning issues either, perfect nut. The truss rod is in a perfect condition, of course, this is a mint guitar, and it is adjusted by this 5 16th of an inch Allen wrench that comes with most Gibson guitars. And covering the truss rod hole is the cherry on top of the cake, the truss rod cover with the Thunder Horse logo. One of the few things that shows this is a Brandon Small signature Thunder Horse. I love the font as well. It sits very classy on this guitar. I will shut up for a couple of seconds and let you enjoy this masterpiece in the daylight. Thunder Horse. Are you still watching? Let's continue, shall we? Let's check out the back of the horse. Solid mahogany one piece body that you cannot make out because it's painted with a black paint. Black finishes of course are scratch magnets. This guitar being mint, even in this condition you can see a lot of scratches at a certain angle. Nothing you can really do. You can use some guitar polish, some guitar wax to make them less visible but they're always gonna be there. So live with it. <sighs> Electronics cavity seem to be a mess like most Gibsons, even the high-end ones. Again, neck volume, bridge volume, master tone. And one of the pots, the bridge volume, seems to be a bit faulty. It scratches and it cuts off at the fully open position, so I might have to take it out and use some contact spray or WD-40, whatever I have. See if I can get that fixed. I took out one of the speed knobs so I can get uh, the pot out from the back and doing so I noticed the checking lines. Look how they go around the pot, it's just interesting to see with the speed knob removed. I didn't want to disconnect any of the cables so I pulled the pot just a little bit so I can get an access. The hole for the pot is on the other side and I didn't want to deal with this washer over here. Pods go faulty over time when not used, it's pretty common. You should use some contact spray, or in my case W40, to spray in the hole over here. And then rotate the pot all the way from open to close position a couple of times, so it gets everywhere inside, and it should be good. 
rectangular jack plate with a switchcraft jack and the original strap button with a really thick screw if you want to install aftermarket keep that in mind one more here near the neck joint doesn't interfere with the access to the higher fret some people move them over here but as I said I don't like drilling my guitars set neck joint feels a lot better than the hammer explorer that I had last week you can see it sits really low and almost flushed against the body it allows for a better access to the higher frets not that I hang around much here mahogany neck should be one piece we cannot see much because it's painted in black perfect condition of course neck feels really comfortable here around the first fret and let me show you some outside shots of this guitar in the daylight let's check it out inline 6 chrome grover tuners if I tilt it like this you can see the serial number and let me try to showcase this glorious made in USA stamp over here barely you can see it yeah there it is <laughs> if this guitar gets refinished this will disappear entirely all right let's put this guitar back together didn't need much of a cleaning just some fingerboard oil some fret polish nothing too serious even though it's a rich light fingerboard still needs some oil like the ebony i always check if the tuners are tightened correctly and they are let's put on the bridge back and 11s for drop c as most guitars the thunder horse came from the factory with 1046 set in e standard but Brandon Small plays in even lower than drop C, he plays in C standard. Even though I didn't have any tuning stability issues, I applied some tuned paste at the nut and bridge, just to be sure. If I have to compare the sound of this guitar, for example to let's say the Gibson Les Paul Customs, the Thunder Horse has this fuzzy type of sound, the PAF pickups are not that tight in the low and mid range. But this gives it a, a different type of character that I really like. They are a perfect fit for this guitar. But let's check out some tones, guys. damn right I'm gonna play the Thunder Horse song on this Thunder Horse Explorer 
but I will do that in a separate video because of copyright reasons. I will put a link to the guitar playthrough in the description below, check it out guys. Let's check out the case of the Thunder Horse. Of course it's an explorer, it has a big case and you're not gonna be able to fit it in most back seats. Three hinges, close like this, they're pretty sturdy and feel good to operate and I like this thick leather handle. I also like the texture of the case, it's almost like a snake skin. Gibson USA logo and white stitching on the edge, not too many scratches. Let's open it up and see. Pretty damn good looking on the inside too. This case makes a wonderful job of displaying the Thunder Horse. I'm really glad that Gibson didn't go with black for the interior of the case, the white really makes the Thunder Horse pop. Check out this beautiful Gibson branded leather piece, brown leather for opening up the compartment over here. And let's check out what we got inside. We got the warranty, okay, some case candy, and this this guy right here is important. We sweat the details, of course you do. Let's check out the QC list, quality checklist as they call it. Exterior finish, playability, case inspection, pre-pack checklist. What else do we have here? And the date. We can see it over here, 2012. Serial number. Inspected by. Packed by. Usual stuff. This is how it looks on the front side. Let's see what else we have here. It's the standard Gibson warranty that comes with most guitars. Oh, look at that. Owner's manual. I wonder if it says how to be a good guitarist. Let's check out. I'm really curious. Is there an explorer in the manual? Nope. Les Paul V? Explorer? No. I don't know how to use my explorer now. Come on, this is useless. And this envelope right here came from the guys from uh, Guitar Candy. They sent me some branded picks, some stickers, it's really nice of them. Here's their card. I strongly recommend their Reverb Shop, check it out if you have the chance. Making this video gave me a huge seller regret. I sold the guitar to a friend of mine a month ago simply because I'm a Les Paul guy and I'm not yet ready to build a collection of guitars that I rarely use. This Thunder Horse is very very important guitar to me because it's the first one that I had to struggle to let go. You know exactly what I mean, it's one of those guitars that you think you're gonna own forever. But the guitar has been sitting in its case for the last two years, so I figured it's time to pass it on to someone who would truly appreciate it. And I'm truly happy that my friend loves it and plays it every day. He plays mainly 8 string instruments, so imagine how much he must have liked it to get it. Enjoy it man, you got one of the best explorers ever made there. I even managed to make some money out of this guitar even though I sold it to a friend for a fair price of around $3000. My friend can easily get more money out of it if he decides to list it in revert. I could have done this too, but I wanted the guitar to stick around if I wanted to make a video of it one day. And here it is. I really, really liked the Thunder Horse. If you want one, get it as soon as you find it because these are not going to get cheaper. Knowing myself, I would probably buy one again down the line. I sincerely doubt that I would find one in such a good mint condition as this, but who knows, life is full of surprises. I love a guitar with a good story and the Thunder Horse is definitely one of those. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I did making it and more will be coming soon so subscribe.